And joining us now is Dr. Howard Fuller. He is the former superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools and the founder and director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette University in Wisconsin. Great to have you here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making the trip. You know that we are in the midst of a great debate in this community right now over black focused schools. Right. A lot of folks want them. A lot of folks think they're the worst thing in the world. Right. Make the case for them. Why do you think they're a good idea? Well, I think they're a good idea because they can be a part of a, a broad array of options because I believe that you want to give parents as many choices as possible. I think secondly, for a number of young people and their families, this may be something that can be used to, to further their education if it is done correctly. Uh, I don't think that a black-focused school or an African-centered school in and of itself will create a great school. But for some young people, this focus could be the, the spur that they need to stay in school and to achieve academically. You've heard one of the criticisms, I'm sure, being that it creates an aura of unreality about the educational experience, that at the end of the day, these young black kids have got to graduate from this school and join the quote unquote white world where the suggestion is they will not be uh, adequately prepared for that experience. What's your experience on that? I, I think people who say that are people who don't know what they're talking about, uh, to be blunt about it. I mean, the reality of it is that if you have a quality school that is African-centered, what you do is you give people a, a strong concept of themselves, but you give them the skills that they need to participate in the larger world. I would argue that if I come out of a school and I'm clear about who I am and, and my place in the world, but I'm also able to speak, I'm able to write, I'm able to do math, I'm able to think, I'm able to analyze, I'm able to conquer technology, I'm going to be an excellent citizen because I'm going to be centered in who I am, but I'm going to be prepared to deal with the larger world. So I, I think this notion that you would somehow be crippled is, is ludicrous. There is an irony here, though, in as much as in your country more than 60 years ago, there was a Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education, right. which was designed to desegregate the schools because separate was not equal. Right. And now here we are talking, though, about putting all, well, we're not talking about putting all the blacks in one school, but we're talking about black only or black focused schools, which would be attended by only black kids. Well, Given first, the history, does that make sense to you? Well, first of all, it's, it's not clear to me that. You open, I, I would not open up a school that have a, a focus and say only black kids could attend. I think but you. But that's the reality, though. Well, right? but I'm saying only you black kids would attend. Well, but you open it up to everyone. There, there, there's a clear difference between giving people an option and say you cannot attend because you're of a particular race, or you can only attend because you're of a particular race. I think that is more than a semantical difference. And in, incidentally, I have my own issues with Brown in, in, in terms of how Brown was implemented in the United States and, and the sociological foundations that led to the conclusion that something that's all black is inherently inferior. So we could have another show okay. on just that. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I don't see why it would be problematic to establish a school that might have a focus on an African-American experience. You open that up to, to all people who want to attend it. If only African-American uh, or, or, or students from African descent want to attend, I don't know why that would be such a huge problem in a community like Toronto. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the program is that you have been through this in Milwaukee, yes. well ahead of us. We're going through it now. You've been through it already. How did it come to pass in your city? Well, what happened is that back in the early 90s, there was a study on the, uh, what was happening with black males. And the effort was really to create two all-male academies. And the National Organization of Women threatened to sue. So it morphed into uh, in two African-American immersion schools, a, a elementary school and a middle school. But it started out to create two black male academies. Okay, so you had these two schools created, right. and what transpired after that? Well, um, one of them has been successful. The elementary school is still open. The middle school closed because of declining enrollment. And the lesson that you draw from that is, I even if you're going to have a focus on the black experience or an African-centered or whatever terminology you're using, you have to create a quality school. So the reality of it is that you have to have a school that is mission driven. You have to have quality teachers. You have to have a curriculum that is clearly understood. Did you not have those things? Uh, in the school in the, that end, in the end, no. I, I don't mm -hmm. think we did a good job, frankly, of establishing the schools initially. 
I don't think over time we did the job that we needed to ensure that it was a quality experience for the kids. Just because you call something African-centered or black focus, that isn't magic. It isn't by definition going to be great. You have to make it great. You're simply using that as a focus. Were the teachers in those schools all African-Americans No, themselves? they weren't. In fact, um, my first year as superintendent, I was taken to court by the union because uh, our, our the way that, that that teachers got to school was seniority based and so there were seven openings when I took over as superintendent and we had a restriction because of the suit on integration that you could only have a certain percentage of black teachers in a school so you could only have 30 percent black teachers in any one school so there were seven openings three in the elementary school four in the middle school I wanted to put all African-American teachers in there these were volunteers we were going to excess no white teachers but the union wanted to put new white teachers coming into the district into those positions I put the African-Americans there I was sued I lost in court which I knew I was going to lose because I violated the contract that makes no sense does anybody uh, realize that? Correct. <laughs> okay. I'm with you <laughs> uh, okay so the white teachers ended up going to the schools, one of the schools ended up failing. Is the conclusion that you draw from this that if you're going to create a black focus school, yes, all 100 percent of the teachers in that school must be, no. in our case, African Canadian and yours African American? No, the conclusion that I draw is you have to start out with quality principles, one of which deals with quality teachers. You clearly, in my view, would want to have the predominant uh, faculty be people of African descent but you want to attract good teachers of all races because at the end of the day what matters is whether or not these kids come out of this school with the capacity to the, the skills that they need to participate in this flat world and the african-american experience in and of itself is not going to prepare them to do that that experience overlaid with the skills that I've talked about previously would be of great value not only to those families but to the Toronto society. Did the black students who went to those black focus schools see their marks improve? Some did and some didn't. Uh, <laughs> again, it was, it was mixed. Not clear uh, cut, eh? No, see, that's, and, and that's, see, well, but that's the reality of it is that the, the decisions that people make, everybody wants everything to be black, white, clear, this is it. And the reality of it is the world isn't like that, and nor are schools. Okay, but when you're, when, I'm not saying you, but when, when advocates are suggesting a major change to the way, right. essentially, our school system does business here, right. and they say, okay, demonstrate for me that when it's been done in the past, it's been an unalterably, inalterably positive experience, and you say, I can't tell you that. Right. Can you see why people are concerned about not wanting to go to this new system? Well, I think people who are concerned about that have to ask themselves, though, how is the current system working? And so what I'm saying is the beauty of this is you can learn from other people's experience. So you can implement this in a way that gives you the greatest chance of being successful. So I, I think you have the, 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 the best situation because what you can do is you can look out at experiences that have worked because there have been situations in America where it has worked well and you can learn from that as you move forward to implement it in Toronto sure people ought to question people should question everything you shouldn't just accept oh yeah this is a great idea but you should not be opposed to it out of some type of knee-jerk uninformed reaction to what's possible well fair enough but there, there are many in this country and you've probably run into this in the past who think we re our society and your society are so different that the fact that you had an experience with this a decade ago is no yellow brick road for us in terms of leading us to, oh, to any kind of conclusions. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I don't, I don't come to Toronto saying I got the answer. All I can do is explain my experience. You can either say it's useful or it's not. You know what I'm saying? But I'm you not, think it is? I think it is, but I think it has to be done within your context. So, for example, if I were going to put together a school that, that had an African-centered experience in Toronto, the first thing I've got to do is to understand what is the commonality because so many of the people of African descent are from the islands, if, the, you know, if it's <laughs> right. Trinidadian or Jamaican. Yours, exactly, right. and then you have people from the continent, whether they're from Somali or wherever they're from. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing you've got to do is, is in, in my view, the commonality actually is the African continent. But then you've got to move forward because culture is such a dynamic reality and talk about how that has impacted in Trinidad, in Guyana, in Antigua, in Dominica, in Jamaica. And then what about the people who are from 
Africa itself. And so you, I, I think you have a very difficult but doable task, but you start understanding the kind of foundation that you're going to have to build on. And, and then once you talk about that and make a decision as to how you're going to approach it, you still got to come back and say, we got to make sure we've got quality teachers. We got to make sure that we deal with math, we deal with science, we deal with writing, we deal with all of these issues that kids need, and we're going to incorporate that African experience within that foundation. Okay. Let us, in our remaining moments, broaden the discussion. I know one of the things you said off the top of our conversation was, you like the notion of black focused schools because it does offer more choice to parents in education. I want to pick up on that. Milwaukee, your city, leads the United States when it comes to the school voucher program, right. something we have no experience with up here. Here's a quote. In fact, during the 2006-07 school year, voucher payments broke the $100 million mark. Almost 18,000 students attended private school on publicly funded vouchers. That according to an article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel of a couple of years ago. Now, you were the superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools. Right. You resigned over the issue of vouchers. How well, actually I, actually, I didn't resign over vouchers. I, I, I resigned because I wanted to bring into the school district at that time the Edison Schools, which was a for-profit entity. And the, school, and the union ran a slate against what I wanted to do. And I actually still had a five to four majority, but I was going to be spending all of my life okay, trying to count the, to five. The point, <laughs> so, but the point was you were for vouchers, oh, they, I was they for were vouchers. against them. Oh yeah. Right. What's the case to be made for vouchers? Well the case is that we shouldn't have in America where only those of us with money have the ability to choose the best schools for our children. So a voucher system works how? Well, it, first of all, there is no such thing as a voucher system. There are voucher systems, so you, meaning that you can organize them differently. In Milwaukee, the voucher program is set up for low-income parents. I don't support universal vouchers. I support means-tested vouchers, which gives low-income and working-class parents the options that those of us with money have. But basically what it is is, is you give a low-income person says, here's a voucher for $5,000. You can spend it on the public school system or take it somewhere else? No, no. In, in Milwaukee, the way it works, you get $6,500 okay. and you can take it to any private school in the city of Milwaukee, either religious or non-religious. And the public will fund that private education to that extent, the $6,500? Correct. And this makes sense because? Because at the end of the day, what's most important is not what type of school a kid goes to, it is what are the results in terms of giving them an education? Because I would argue that public education and the public school system are two different things. The public school system is a delivery mechanism. Public education is the philosophical base, and we decided that in order for the public to be educated, we were going to organize schools in a certain way which means you can also organize in a different way. Just like, for example, in the United States, people made a decision to allow students to get Pell Grants from the government and to access religious and non-religious higher education, because we thought it was in our best interest to okay, do that. But you so it's the same philosophy. You've got to explain this, though. We just had an election in this province a couple of months ago right. where the party that was espousing giving $400 million of public dollars to private schools in order to move somewhat down the road of what you're talking about was thrashed. Right. So uh, you, you, you've got a job to explain to people watching this, I think, right now, on why it makes sense to give hundreds of millions of dollars of public tax dollars to people who are essentially running private, in most cases, for-profit schools. Well, actually, well, it, it can be both for-profit and non-profit. Okay, take that out okay, of the equation. Right. Yeah, let's not throw in the profit aspect. Okay. I, I would simply say this. I really don't have that task because I can't come across the board and make an argument about what people ought to do in Canada. I can simply say that I believe that you ought to have a way for low-income and working-class people to be able to exercise the choices that those of us with money have. And I understand that there's a great philosophical and ideological divide on that question. Well, less here, you would think. We have Medicare. You get right. access to, to, you know, relatively high standard of care in this country, whether right. you're rich or poor. Right. You know, if you're really rich, you can go somewhere else, obviously, and get better. But right. We don't do that with schooling. We do it with health care. Well, well, I don't know. Do you have a, a, a union in America? I mean, what, what I think you start getting at here are what are people's economic interests? Mm -hmm. 
and, and who's the most organized entities when it comes to pushing forth elections. And, and, and I think we have to be clear here. A school district is as much of an economic enterprise as it is an educational mm -hmm. reality. So when you start talking about changing who controls the flow of the money, you're going to get opposition. And you, and, 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 and be, and, but you're never going to say that that's the reason why you oppose it. You're always going to couch it in more high-standing moral terms. Just so I'm clear, at the end of the day, regardless of the issue, it's always a power struggle. Who gets to run the school system, the teacher unions, or the administration? Is that it's, how it works? It's all about the money, and it's always <laughs> all about power. It's always about power. You sound like Woodward and Bernstein, eh? Follow the money. It's, always <laughs> it's all about power. Um, Dr. Furlow, let me ask you one more question. Uh, you are in a uh, political season in the United States yes. right now. Right. You're choosing your nominations for the uh, respective parties for the presidential candidates. Explain this to me. American blacks overwhelmingly support the Democratic Party. Yes. The Democratic Party overwhelmingly opposes vouchers. Yes. Which you say could make life a whole lot better for most of the you know, poorest Americans, many of whom are black. Right. The Republican Party has virtually no support, support in the African American community, and yet a lot of their ideas on education are more in line with what you're suggesting. Right. Now, I know you're not a, a Democrat or a Republican. Correct. But explain that to me. You know what? It's a difficult thing to explain. <laughs> I, I mean, you were I, say right. That. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, say anything that just doesn't make sense. But let me explain it to you this way. One of the the realities that we're dealing with here is that if you go back historically, and and I've been trying to make this argument in America, the issue of choice for African Americans did not start with Milton Friedman. The issue of choice for African Americans started with the Freedmen's Bureau. And I can go back and show you historically why it is in the best interest of African American people to have the most options. And what you're beginning to see, although it's small now, I mean, our organization, the Black Alliance for Educational Options, just had a meeting in New Orleans of elected black Democrats who support parental choice. <laughs> Three years ago, when we first held that meeting, there were like 10 of them. There were 40. African-American elected officials, their key officials who are beginning to understand this within the Democratic Party. So the lieutenant governor of the state of New York, um, my good friend, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patterson, Malcolm Smith, who's the minority leader in the Senate in the state of New York, Dwight Evans, who is the ranking Democrat on appropriations in Pennsylvania, Cory Booker, who is the, the 34, 35-year-old mayor of the city of, of, of Newark. Uh, Rodney Hubbard, who is a state rep from Missouri. Uh, Representative Badan, who's going to be real critical to the efforts that we're going to make in Louisiana. What's beginning to happen, slowly, is that you're beginning to get black Democrats who can no longer stand up and say, I'm going to be lock, stock, and barrel with the teachers' union when I keep looking in my community and thousands and thousands of my kids are not learning, and you all just keep telling me, put more money in it, put more money in it, put more money in it. And I think over the next few years, you're going to see that that crack is going to widen because it's simply not sustainable over time, given the reality of what is happening in the communities that they represent. It's very good of you to share so much of your time with us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Oh, it was my pleasure. Howard Fuller, the former superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools.